The Great Hunger by Patrick Kavanagh Part 4 Their intellectual life consisted in reading Reynolds' News or the Sunday Dispatch, with sometimes an old almanac brought down from the ceiling, or a school reader brown with the droppings of thatch. The sporting results or the headlines of war was a humbug, profound as the highbrows arcana. Pat tried to be wise to the abstraction of all that, but its secret dribbled down his waistcoat like a drink from a strainer. He wagered a bob each way on the derby. He got a straight tip from a man in a shop. A double from the guineas it was, and thought himself a master mathematician when one of them came up and he could explain how much he'd had drawn on the double if the second leg had followed the first. He was betting on form and breeding, he claimed, and the man that did that could never be burst. After that they went on to the war, and the generals on both sides were shown to be as stupid as hell. If he'd taken that road, they remarked of a marshal, he'd have... Oh, they knew their geography well. That was their university. Maguire was an undergraduate who dreamed from his lowly position of rising to a professorship like Larry McKenna or Duffy or the pig Gelder Nallen, whose knowledge was amazing. A treble, full multiple odds, that's flat porter. Another one. No, you're wrong about that thing I was telling you. Did you part with your filly, Jack? I heard you sold her. The students were all savants by the time of pub close. A year passed and another hurried after it, and Patrick Maguire was still six months behind life, his mother six months ahead of it, and his sister straddle-legged across it, one leg in hell and the other in heaven, and between the purgatory of middle-aged virginity she prayed for release to heaven or hell. His mother's voice grew thinner, like a rust-worn knife, but it cut venomously as it thinned. It cut him up the middle till he became more woman than man, and it cut through to his mind before the end. Another field whitened in the April air, and the harrows rattled over the seed. He gathered the loose stones off the ridges carefully, and grumbled to his men to hurry. He looked like a man who could give advice to foolish young fellows. He was forty-seven, and there was depth in his jaw, and his voice was the voice of a great cattle dealer a man with whom the fair green gods break even. I think I ploughed that lay the proper depth. She ought to give a crop if any land gives. Drive slower with the foal mare, Joe. Joe, a young man of imagined wives, smiles to himself and answered like a slave. You needn't fear or fret. I'm taking her as easy, as easy as... Easy there, Fanny, easy, pet. They loaded the day-scoured implements on the cart, and the shadows of poplars crookened the furrows. It was evening, evening. Patrick was forgetting to be lonely, as he used to be in April's long ago. It was the menopause, the misery pause. The schoolgirls passed his house laughing every morning, and sometimes they spoke to him familiarly. He had an idea... Schoolgirls of thirteen would see no political intrigue in an old man's friendship. Love, the heifer waiting to be nosed by the old bull. That notion passed too. There was the danger of talk, and jails are narrower than the five-sod ridge, and colder than the black hills facing our man February. He sinned over the warm ashes again, and his crime, the long law's long arm, could not serve with time. His face set like an old judge's pose. Respectability and righteousness stand for no nonsense. The priest from the altar called Patrick Maguire's name to collect to hold the collecting box in the chapel door during all the Sundays of May. His neighbours envied him his holy rise, but he walked down from the church with affected indifference and took the measure of heaven angle-wise. He could still laugh and sing, but not the wild laugh or the abandoned harmony now that called the world to new silliness from the top of a wooden gate when thirty-five could take the sparrow's bow. Let us be kind. Let us be kind and sympathetic. Maybe life is not for joking or for finding happiness in. 
this tiny light in oriental darkness, looking out chance windows of poetry or prayer, and the grief and defeat of men like these peasants is God's way, maybe, and we must not want too much to see. The twisted thread is stronger than the wind-swept fleece, and in the end who shall rise in throats high peace? And whose is in the world now, even now? Oh, let us kneel where the blind ploughman kneels, and learn to live without despairing in a mud-walled space, illiterate, unknown and unknowing. Let us kneel where he kneels, and feel what he feels. One day he saw a daisy, and he thought it reminded him of his childhood. He stopped his car to look at it. Was there a fairy hiding behind it? He helped a poor woman whose cow had died on her. He dragged home a drunken man on a winter's night. And one rare moment he heard the young people playing on the railway style. And he wished them happiness and whatever they most desired from life. He saw the sunlight and begrudged no man his share of what the miserly soil and soul gives in a season to a ploughman. And he cried for his own loss one late night on the pillow. And yet thanked the God who had arranged these things. Was he a saint? A Matt Talbot of Monaghan? His sister Mary Ann spat poison at the children, who sometimes came to the door selling raffle tickets for holy funds. Get out, you little tramps, she would scream, as she shook to the hens an armful of crumbs. But Patrick often put his hand deep down in his trouser pocket and fingered out a penny, or maybe a tobacco-stained caramel. You're soft, said the sister, with other people's money. It's not a bit funny. The cards are shuffled and the deck laid flat for cutting. Tom Malone cut for Trump. I think we'll make this game the last one, a tanner one. Hearts, right. I see you're breaking your two-year-old. Play quick, Maguire. The clock says it's half past ten. Kate, throw another sod in that fire. One of the card players laughs and spits into the flame across his shoulder. Outside, a noise like a rat among the hen roosts. The cock crows over the frosted townland of the night. Eleven o'clock, and still the game goes on and the players seem to be drunk in an orient opium den. Midnight, one o'clock, two. Somebody's leg has fallen asleep. What about home? Maguire, are you using double tree this week? Why, do you want it? Play the ace. There's it. And that's the last card for me. A wonderful night we had. Duffy's place is very convenient. Is that a ghost or a tree? And so they go home with dragging feet, and their voices rumble like laden carts, and they are happy as the dead or sleeping. I should have led that ace of hearts. The fields are bleached white, the wooden tubs full of water were white in the winds that blew through Brannigan's Gap on their way from Siberia. The cows on the grassless heights followed the hay that had wings. The February fodder that hung itself on the black branches of the hilltop hedge. A man stood beside a potato pit and clapped his arms and pranced on the crisp roots to keep himself warm. Then he buck leapt about the potatoes and scooped them in the basket. He looked like a bucking suck calf whose spine was being tickled. Sometimes he stared across the bogs, and sometimes he straightened his back and vaguely whistled a tune that weakened his spirit and saddened his terrier dogs. A neighbour passed with a spade on his shoulder, and Patrick Maguire bent like a bridge, whistled a good morning under his oxter, and the man on the other side of the hedge champed his spade on the road at his toes and talked an old sentimentality while the wind blew under his clothes. The mother sickened and stayed in bed all day, her head hardly dented the pillow, so light and thin it had worn. But she still inquired after the household affairs. She held the strings of her children's punch and duty, and when her mouth opened, it was her truth that the dolls would have spoken, if they hadn't been made of wood and tin. Did you open the barn door, Pat, to let the young calves in? The priest called to see her every Saturday, and she told him her troubles and fears. If Mary Ann were settled, I'd die in peace. I'm getting on in years. 
You're a good woman, said the priest, and your children will miss you when you're gone. The likes of you this parish never knew. I'm sure they'll not forget the work you've done. She reached five bony crooks under the tick. Five pounds for masses, won't you say them quick? She died one morning in the beginning of May, and a shower of sparrow notes was the litany for her dying. The holy water was sprinkled on the bedclothes, and her children stood around the bed and cried because it was too late for crying. A mother dead, the tired sentiment. Mother, mother, was a shallow pool whose sorrow could hardly wash its feet. Mary Ann came away from the deathbed and boiled the calves their gruel. Oh, what was I doing when the procession passed? Where was I looking? Young women and men, and I might have joined them. Who bent the coin of my destiny that is stuck in the slot? I remember a night when we walked through the moon of Dunnock Moin, four of us seeking adventure. It was midsummer, forty years ago. Now I know the moment that gave the turn to my life. O oh Christ, I am locked in a stable with pigs and cows forever. <laughs>